Hello class, welcome to your overview lecture on the history of Judaism. Every Christian knows or should know that the Old Testament is a Jewish book, and furthermore that the New Testament was written by Jews within an essentially Judaic profession of faith. What exactly separates Christianity from Judaism is not sacred text or scripture. The way the New Testament came to be taken, to be edited and codified into dogma and doctrine, and interpreted by non-Jewish communities. Not only is every Christian thus spiritually, in a very real sense, Jewish in the historical roots of their faith, but also due to the long history of the diaspora, many, if not most of us, have Jewish ancestry. For example, when I looked into my own roots, on my father's or the Argentinian side of my family, I discovered that the first Warneses to arrive in Buenos Aires from Cadiz, Spain, in the 1700s bore Jewish names such as Abraham Varnes. They were in all likelihood Sephardic Jews, escaping prosecutions or forced conversions, common in Europe at the time. Such roots are often repressed and forgotten so as to achieve assimilation in the new culture. When I asked my Argentinian relatives about my discovery, some acknowledged the first Varneses in Argentina were in all likelihood Sephardic Jews. Others deny this possibility. It does not fit into their sense of self-identity, even if it's true. Overt and covert anti-Semitism became a powerful force in Western culture and Western Christianity, such that the essential closeness of Christianity and Judaism as religions, as well as the pervasiveness of Jewish ethnic and cultural heritage within the Christian world, are often repressed and denied. I'll begin at the beginning, however, and try to give an overall account of the history of Judaism. These three core ideas are probably ethical monotheism. There is one God who is both transcendent and immanent. Their scriptural tradition focuses above all on the Torah and the Talmud, the Torah being the first five books of the Old Testament, and the Talmud, the tradition of rabbinical interpretation thereof. And third, that the Jewish people have a special covenant with Yahweh or God, and they are an elected or chosen people. We study the history of Judaism, we divide it into two periods. One is biblical Judaism from roughly Abraham to the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 AD, and Rabbinical Judaism, which is post-Second Temple Judaism or Diasporic Judaism. Scholars believe Abraham probably existed. In the narrative told in the Torah, the events before Abraham are sometimes said to be based in real historical events and sometimes mythical. In terms of contemporary Judaism, there seem to be three basic elements of Jewish identity. One is ethnic, that is, born of a Jewish parent, religious, following religious practices and customs, or cultural, which is being immersed in Jewish communities and their music, literature, food, cultural norms, etc. Jewish identity can be grounded in any one of the three elements or any combination of them. For example, religiously, Judaism is inherited from the mother. Someone born of a non-Jewish mother can still adopt the Jewish faith The Torah, or Pentateuch in Latin, consists of five books. The five books mythically said to have been written by Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. We'll address its actual authorship in a minute, according to the contemporary documentary hypothesis. Next, there are the books of the prophets, or the Nevim, and there are earlier and later prophets. And finally, there are the writings, or the Ketuvim, which consist of songs and prayers and other wisdom literatures. Genesis 1 and 2 at time displays the influence of Babylonian as well as earlier Akkadian Sumerian culture. Chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis are at least 200 years apart, and sometimes it's noted they may contain conflicting myths of the creation of human beings. In Genesis 1, God creates man and woman in his image seemingly simultaneously, indicating perhaps that God himself is gender neutral or androgynous and sometimes leading to speculation of what has been edited or redacted out of Book 1 of Genesis, which is whether the woman that God creates in Genesis 1 is the same woman, Eve, that is recreated from Adam's rib in Genesis 2. Of course, interpretations of the Garden of Eden myth vary widely, and we'll address some of those as we proceed here and elsewhere in lectures this week. As to post-Edenic myths in Genesis, the most central and widely discussed include the two brothers, Abel and Cain, one a shepherd, the other a farmer. Abel offering an animal sacrifice to God, Cain offering a vegetal sacrifice, God receiving the animal sacrifice, but not Cain's vegetal one, and Cain being consumed with envy and self-hatred, murdering his brother, and thus further solidifying the sins of man. 
Next, there is the tale of Noah's Ark and God's covenant with Noah. And next, the myth of the Tower of Babel. At this point, Genesis veers out of what we can only read historically as myth into the realm of history. Abraham being a great leader of the Jewish people in the land of Canaan, and Moses leading the Jewish people out of Egypt in the Exodus. These events seem to have happened, we're just not sure about the earlier ones. Although Moses' Ten Commandments are usually the most remembered part by Christians, there is an enormous multiplicity of legal commandments in the Old Testament or Torah, many of which are no longer applicable to our cultural situation, but some of which are long overdue to be revived, such as early Jewish agricultural practices. Covenant in Hebrew Brit is an agreement in which promises are made under oath either to carry out or to abstain from certain specified actions. The first biblical covenant is when God promises Noah to never send a flood again. The most major one is with Abraham, thus we speak of the Abrahamic faiths. In Genesis 12, 1-2, God's words to Abraham go like this, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation. Circumcision is the sign of the covenant in Genesis 17, which Jewish males usually undergo eight days after birth. For Jewish females, there is a naming ceremony called Simchat Bat, or Joy of a Daughter. The most important aspect of the covenant with Abraham is that it identifies the Jewish people as chosen. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God, has chosen you from out of all the peoples on the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. Israel is the chosen people that it identifies itself as choosing God. The origin of the term Israel is not certain. Israel is sometimes said to mean the one who struggled with God. The term Hebrew emerges as a description for the descendants of Abraham and Jonah. The term Jew derives from the term Judah, one of the two traditional kingdoms of the Israelite people, Judah also being the son of Jacob. And the term Semitic derives from Shem, that is, the eldest of Noah's three sons. When was the Torah written down? Traditional Jews assert the Torah was revealed to Moses on Mount Sinai and written down by him. Contemporary scholars assert that texts were composed by different authors at different times. This is known as the documentary hypothesis. The final form of all three parts of the Tanakh were probably completed as follows, the Torah being completed in its final form in the 6th to 4th centuries BCE, the Nevim in the 2nd century BCE, and the Ketuvim only by the 2nd century CE. The name of God for Judaism is a tetragrammaton, or four-letter word, Yahweh, and its possible root meaning is to live or to be, from Haya. Yahweh is often explained as I am who I am, I am who causes things to happen, he who causes things to be, and I am who I will become. In various periods of Jewish history, the Tetragrammaton is considered unpronounceable, and it is substituted for terms such as Adonai, my Lord, or Hashem, the name, and also Elohim. Around a thousand years after the periods of Abraham and Moses, the Jewish people seem to solidify their presence in the ancient Near East and to regroup from the Exodus, creating a significant kingdom in the region. David is often identified as Israel's greatest king, whose reign begins around 1000 BCE, and he's referred to as the Messiah or Masiach, the Anointed One. The wise King Solomon is said to have built the first temple, which calls all the Jewish people to celebrate and worship. Sometimes shortly after Solomon's death, Israel is said to have split into two kingdoms, Israel in the north and Judah in the south. By 722 BCE, Israel falls to the Assyrians, this is known as the first exile, and Judah falls to the Babylonians, sometime later in 586 BC, the second exile. These events are characterized by the destruction of Solomon's temple and dispersion throughout the lands of Babylonia, and the overall result we describe as the diaspora, that is, the dispersion of Jews outside of Israel the first and the second exiles being remembered as the fundamental trauma of the alienation of the Jewish people as those who lose their own homeland. As to Jewish theology and the basic credo of Jewish faith, it's not until the prophetic period that we find the first unambiguous statement of monotheism. For example, in Israel 45, 21, there is no other God beside me, a righteous God and a savior. There is no one beside me. This is very different than God to Moses in the Ten Commandments, who states only that Israel should worship no other God beside me, suggesting that perhaps there are other gods. 
The second exile is further described in Psalm 137. How can we sing a song of the Lord on alien soil? Cyrus of Persia allowed the Jewish people to return in 539 BCE. Some Jews decided to stay in Babylonia, which became one of the most vibrant centers and eventually produced one of the most central texts of Judaism, the Babylonian Talmud. The second temple period of Judaism is from 515 BCE to 70 CE. At the beginning of this period, the temple is rebuilt and rededicated. Persian rule of the region gives way to Alexander the Great's Hellenistic Empire in the 4th century BCE, and this initiates a process of Hellenization, some Jews embracing Greek culture, some rejecting it. And eventually this leads to the writings of Philo of Alexandria, who was likely the greatest philosopher-theologian among Hellenized Jews, just before the period of the birth, life, and mission of Jesus. The Hellenistic Empire gradually transformed into the Seleucid dynasty, that is, reflecting a fusion of Hellenistic and Egyptian culture. During this period, Jewish sects can be divided into roughly four, five, or six basic clans. There are the Sadducees, or Temple Jews, who are of aristocratic and royal descent. Then there are the Pharisees, or the priestly families, whose emphasis is on piety in the city. The Pharisees inheriting the prophetic tradition and giving rise to the rabbinical one. Then there are the zealots, or anti-colonialists, considered terrorists by ruling Hellenistic and then Roman government. Next, the Essenes, who are rural and monastic Jews, from whose communities has been discovered and retranslated the Dead Sea Scrolls, written in Aramaic, among other texts. And finally, the Nazarenes, who were the Jewish followers of Jesus. By the time of the Roman occupation, increasing conflicts led to increasing oppression and the end of collaborationist policies. During collaborationism, especially the Sadducees and more or less the Pharisees participated in the governments of the occupiers. Messianism, present since the time of Herod and Salome, increased, and the destruction of the Second Temple occurred in 70 CE. From the point of view of Judaism, during this period a Gentile was anyone who was not Jewish. The basic points of consensus between the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the Essenes, the Zealots, and the Nazarenes was within their Judaism on the oneness of God, the authority and sacred nature of Torah, Israel as the chosen people, and the temple as a place where God and Israel meet. The siege at Masada is another important event in the history of the destruction of the Second Temple and Rome's end to collaborationist policies with the Jews in the region. It was initially constructed by King Herod as a summer palace, but occupied by a band of zealots during the First Jewish War with Rome in 66 to 70 CE. It became the site of a mass suicide in 73 CE at the end of a long siege by the Roman army. There's a wonderful two-part movie you can watch on this called The Dove Keepers. The destruction of the Second Temple and the siege Masada together constitute the historical end of Biblical Judaism and the beginning of modern or rabbinical Judaism. Four key terms in Jewish faith include Halakha, Mitzvot, Shema, and Tisha B'Av. Halakha means following the 613 commandments that one finds in the Torah, which means walking in the way of God. Many of these commandments are socially minded and ecological in character. Next, Mitzvot, which means deeds of loving kindness, justice, and mercy. Shema is the creed of Judaism, which goes in Deuteronomy, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. A creed that will be adopted in form, although modified in content by Islam, and which is really much simpler and more elegant than the Christian Nicene Creed. Tisha B'Av is the day of mourning to commemorate tragedies affecting the people of all of Israel. A bit more on the documentary hypothesis. According to scholars of the last 100 to 200 years, there are four major layers of historical materials redacted into the Hebrew Bible. One, the Yahwist or Eloist sources, roughly from the period of monarchy of David and Solomon. Two, the Deuteronomic sources, from around 621 BCE or the prophetic age, rooted in the reforms of King Josiah. And three, the priestly sources, dating to around 458 BCE and associated with the priestly reforms of Ezra and Nehemiah. These three layers of text and language in the Bible we've inherited can be recognized by different styles, conventions for naming God, relative antiquity of the Hebrew expressions and forms of grammar which are used. 
how these different layers play out in practice is something we're going to look at in another video. It was the Pharisees who most defined rabbinical Judaism through canonization, thus creating the people of the book. The book is the Torah, which plus the prophets and the writings is the Tanakh, which is finalized by around the first century CE. Around this time, we also find the addition of the Talmud. The Talmud being the formalization of the history of Mishnah or interpretation by the rabbis. The Talmud was finalized between the 2nd and the 6th century CE in two somewhat different forms, the Babylonian and the Palestinian Talmud, beginning around the same time as the Talmudic period and developing after it as well, are the, are the traditions of Kabbalah and mystical Judaism, an early text being the Sefer Yetzirah and a later text being the Zohar. The biggest social and political issue in the era of rabbinical Judaism during the medieval period was that of segregation versus integration. Judaism tending to be more integrated under Islamic rule and segregated under Christian rule. There were also major cultural developments in Judaism during the diaspora. The differences between Sephardic Judaism, that is the development of Judaism in Latinic or Romance language countries surrounding the Mediterranean, these Jews speaking Ladino, are a mixture of Hebrew, Latin, and the local Romance languages of the culture, and on the other hand, Ashkenazic Judaism, developing more in the center of Europe, these Jews speaking Yiddish, or a combination of Hebrew and Germanic or Celtic languages. The rabbinical tradition, which gives us the Talmuds, emerges mostly from out of Pharisaic Judaism, in which the priest or teacher is known as the rabbi, from Rav, teacher. The rabbis were loving legalists who deeply enjoyed debates over the interpretations of the Torah and the Tanakh and considered it a kind of wrestling with God and men. The rabbinical tradition of interpretation is very open-minded and philosophical. Disagreements are often accepted, questioning encouraged within the Talmudic debates. On the right here, you see the layout of an average page in the Talmud, where you have the earliest tradition of interpretation, the Mishnah here, followed by the Gemara, how this interpretation is to be understood by the Council of Rabbis, followed by various interpretations and counter-interpretations which circle around the page like so. The Talmudic interpretation developed by the Rabbinic movement has defined Jewish belief and practice for the past 2,000 years. Synagogues existed before the destruction of the Second Temple, but it was after its destruction that they became so central. Torah study becomes the unifying feature of Judaism. As a textbook comments, if religion, religio, is about being tied and bound into the cosmic drama of life by one story symbolically told and enacted, then Torah was and is such a story. It is a story that embraces not only every minute, hour, and day of rabbinic Jewish life, providing a template to make it holy, but also the whole of time, from the creation of the world to its ultimate messianic redemption. Within the Christian medieval period and the emergence of the Holy Roman Empire, Jews were more or less tolerated. But by the late Middle Ages, this toleration gave way to persecution, except in Spain. Between the 12th and the 13th centuries, a brief golden age in which Judaism flourished occurred, followed by difficulties and persecutions to the present. As already mentioned, Christianity began as a Jewish sect. By the end of the second century CE, however, Christianity was predominantly Gentile, not Jewish, and Jews gradually lost legal protections after 380 CE. This was the era of the emergence to prominence of the idea of supersession, that is, that Christians had superseded or replaced the Jews as God's chosen people. Christian West thus spoke of the Jewish people in terms of the Jewish problem that is, the continuing existence of Jews as obstinate, stiff-necked people who refused to acknowledge the truths of Christianity and even participated in Jesus' death. St. Augustine proposed the negative witness theory, according to which Jewish exile and misery are proofs of the truth of Christianity. Mysticism can be defined in general as a direct and immediate religious experience, unconventional, sometimes heretical, but usually tolerated. In general, we can speak of two types of mysticism, the mysticism of union and of identity, the mysticism of union involving divine human marriage mysteries of some kind, and the mysticism of identity involving not just union with God, but being God, which is clearly blasphemous, but often uneasily tolerated in the very devout. Within Judaism, mysticism often emerged as a new prophetic messianism in troubled times. 
the most significant texts of Jewish mysticism is the Kabbalistic Zohar, or Book of Splendor. According to the Zohar, God's Shekinah, or Divine Presence, is perceivable in all things. God is Ein Sof, the One or Infinite. Human beings are understood as beings of devakut, that is, communion or devotion. And the ideal of Judaic faith and way of life is kavana, or mystical contemplation, always to be combined with the requirements of halakha, or Jewish law. The goal of the Zohar being reunion with the infinite God in finite mortals and the ingathering of Jews from exile to enjoy the messianic kingdom to come. Hasidism also developed in the Middle Ages, became enormously influential, a kind of Orthodox Judaism, but also rooted in mysticism. The Hasidic movement can be seen as Judaism's response of increasing piety in the midst of persecution. A Hasid is a pious one whose life is marked by great devotion. The movement is said to have been founded by Israel ben Eliezer, the Besht, or master of the good name, an ecstatic charismatic figure and speaker who worked miracles using magic, amulets, and spells, and taught joy in God as the appropriate response to the world, no matter how much suffering or atzut sadness is in it. For Hasidism, God is hidden in creation, but there is no distance for the seer, only simha, or a deep, pervasive, passionate joy and celebration. The righteous person, or Zadik, is the link between heaven and earth, a virtuoso of mystical piety and devotion, and a holy contagion through which God sparks a light in others. Under Islam, Jews had the status of dhimis, or protected people. They were seen as partners in monotheism, and their life was much better than under Christian rule. The Christian Dark Ages were a period of growth and prosperity, a golden age for Islam. The majority of the Jewish population at this time was under Islamic rule, and the Jewish population benefited, Arabic replacing Aramaic as the lingua franca of Judaism in the lands of the Muslims. A philosopher known as Moses Maimonides, or Rambam, was a central figure in the emergence of modern Judaism, presented the Mishnah Torah, or codification of Jewish law, and the Twelve Articles of Jewish Faith. His book was titled The Guide to the Perplexed, and he sought to reconcile reason and faith, according to the doctrine that learning never undermines faith. Biblical commandments are rational, and that language helps us to understand God, but anthropomorphic explanations should not be taken literally. Reform Judaism began in the 18th century and has continued throughout the 20th. Reform Jews proposed the concept of a universal human rationality, often inspired by Maimonides, and an Enlightenment secularism was also adopted by Jewish communities around this time. Much like the redo or reface of Judaism under the Hellenistic Empire, the Haskalah or Jewish Enlightenment movement would show the world that one could be an enlightened secular citizen and a Jew at the same time. It was during this period that Jews could use the vernacular instead of Hebrew in worship and even abandon kosher laws. Reform Judaism, the Talmud, is no longer seen as revelation, but rather as history and tradition. And Messianism comes to be identified with scientific progress and the goal of a utopian society. While Reform Judaism was gaining steam, so were new interpretations of orthodoxy, that is, of strict observance of Jewish law, gender separation in prayer, and basically continued rabbinical Judaism in modern contexts. Hence this, the Reform movement posited evolutionary views of Judaic concepts and religious practices and emphasized gender equality. Soon, conservative Judaism emerged as a mediator between Orthodox and Reform positions involving significant commitment to halakha law, plus adaptation to changing circumstance and some gender equality. More recently, we can speak with Kaplan of the Reconstructionist Jude Jewish position, which is a humanistic approach to Judaism and to its basic concepts and practices. Keep in mind, anti-Semitism up until very recently was more rooted in religious ideas, and especially in the doctrine of supersession, but not in the concept of race. As Jews became increasingly secularized in European society, a backlash occurred. Instead of being identified as a religious or ethnic identity, the Jews were now being defined as a race and a biologically corrupt one at that. Previously, and theoretically at least, religious people could be converted. But if the Jews were also biologically corrupt, then all such conversions would be a dead end. 
Following on this invention of the concept of the Jewish race, America never experienced mass pogroms and expulsions, as did most of Europe and Russia, but had plenty of anti-Semitism. The Jewish Enlightenment also led to Jewish socialism. Karl Marx himself was the grandson of a rabbi. Marx's political philosophy of a coming age and classless society is resonant with Joachim de Fiore's vision of a third age of the world and Jewish hopes for a messianic kingdom of God to come. Jewish socialists thus retained in secular form the myth of a redemptive history, according to which we begin in paradise or primitive communism, only to be expelled into a world of selfishness and sin or class conflict, and so are working towards a global classless society in which suffering and justice can be overcome, including the injustice of anti-Semitism. Jewish socialism was also a context for the emerging movement of Zionism. Zion, a biblical term used to refer to the city of David, i.e. Jerusalem, was coined in 1893. The idea is as old as Judaism itself. Tomorrow, in Jerusalem, we will be given the Messiah. Zionism initially received strong backlash from Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox Jewish positions and did not become widespread until after the Holocaust. The Dreyfus Affair in France was a pivotal event. An innocent man and decorated officer was falsely convicted of treason in what was obviously an unfair trial motivated by anti-Semitism. In 1896, Herzl wrote The Jewish State and many organizations and congresses supporting Zionism followed. Britain, through Lord James Balfour, lent support to Zionism in 1917, the famous Balfour Declaration. Within Zionism, Moses and David were recast as militant revolutionary figures, and the Maccabean Revolt and their successors, the Zealots at Masada, were valorized. Zionism was gaining steam across Europe and the world. Nazi Germany emerged in 1933 on a rabid and rampantly anti-Semitic policy, as expressed in Hitler's Mein Kampf. First Jews were merely persecuted and relocated, and at first the National Socialist regime invested some considerable energy into Zionist policies. By 1939 to 1941, however, the world had been engulfed in the total mobilization of World War II. Hitler and his inner circle drafted and enacted during this period the so-called final solution, that is, simply the eradication of Judaism in Europe. Rounding up Jews from every country under Nazi control and shipping them off to work come death camps. Previously, the work camps had been sites of potential relocation. Now they were death factories, pure and simple. The movement from a generalized anti-Semitism to the Holocaust in Nazi policy, gradual but decisive, the Nuremberg Laws being passed in 1935, and the beginning of the final solution in earnest after Kristallnacht in 1938, when 26,000 Jews were placed into concentration camps. Auschwitz became the most famous, but far from the only of these major concentration camps. Only goal became to produce thousands and tens of thousands of deaths a day. Antisemitism had been endemic throughout the Christian and post-Christian West. It was only Hitler and National Socialism that enacted the genocidal theories of racial cleansing to such an extreme degree. Judaism and the Jewish people survived the Holocaust, whilst their numbers greatly reduced. Entered into an entirely new history of the Jewish people, Emil Fackenheim, a Jewish reform rabbi who survived the Holocaust proposing the 614th commandment, we are commanded first to survive as Jews, lest the Jewish people perish. We are commanded second to remember in our very guts and bones the martyrs of the Holocaust, lest their memory perish. We are forbidden thirdly to deny or despair of God, however much we have to contend with him or with belief in him, lest Judaism perish. And we are forbidden finally to despair of the world as a place which is to become the kingdom of God, lest we help make it a meaningless place in which God is dead or irrelevant and everything is permitted. In the aftermath of World War II, the United Nations voted to create a Jewish state in Palestine, the original plan being to partition Palestine into two states. The Palestinian Arab community did not accept this plan. The state of Israel came into being on May 1948, and immediately the Palestinians went to war. What followed was the horribly depressing history of various peace treaties and their violation. Throughout the 50s, 60s, and 70s, most residents of the Middle East supported a two-state solution, but tensions and treaty violations simply never ceased, Israel gradually seizing control of most of the region, 
and the two-state solution becoming in the 21st century something of a dead letter. Temporary Jewish views on LGBTQI plus issues are very diverse. Historically, homosexual intercourse is unacceptable, and this is still the orthodox position. Reform and Reconstructionist Judaism accepts full equality and same-sex marriage and ordination. There are multiple positions within conservative Judaism. Attitudes and responses towards LGBTQI plus issues within Judaism are still evolving. On issues of gender equality, conservative reform and reconstructionist Judaism all support the ordination of women to the rabbinate and full female participation in synagogue services. In the, or in the orthodox tradition, however, women are not allowed to be rabbis and do not count as members of a minion. Studying the Talmud, however, is not permitted. Major festivals of Judaism include Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Hanukkah, Purim, Pesach, and Shavuot. These are the high holidays or days of awe and days of penitence. They begin with Rosh Hashanah, the new year in which Jews examine their conscience for the past year and continue until Yom Kippur or Day of Atonement. When through prayers and fasting, they ask for forgiveness for the sins of the past year. You can read more about each of the Jewish holidays in our textbook. In closing, like many world religions, Judaism is a very diverse and very divergent faith and historical tradition. But it's more unified than most. It's sometimes pointed out, importantly, that the Jewish faith and Jewish people are the only people to survive antiquity in one uninterrupted line to the present. Talk about courage, resiliency, and faith. The only other pre-600 BCE religion which hasn't become classical language being Zoroastrianism, but Zoroastrian being much smaller than global Judaism. In answer to the questions of what is ultimate reality, how we should live in this world, and what is our ultimate purpose, all of Judaism can likely be said to agree with at least these basic principles. The one God of the Torah is the ultimate reality. This divine being is transcendent yet imminent, almighty, benevolent yet just, the creator and sustainer of all things, and revealed in the Torah and in the natural world. Human life should be lived in conformity to the will of God. The commandments or mitzvot of the Torah are the embodiments of that will. Human beings are morally complex, torn between good and evil, but through prayer, meditation, and the performance of good deeds, they can overcome evil. And lastly, mystics believe that our ultimate devotion is to achieve attachment, devakut, to God, all human beings, however, are called upon to serve God in the world. The bliss of the world to come, or olam haba, is greater than any worldly happiness, and we are obliged to bring peace and goodness to the world. So, there you have it, a foolhardy endeavor to describe the entire history of Judaism in less than 30 minutes. I hope that provides a serviceable enough introduction for the next more topic-oriented lecture on the history of Judaism which you can find in the modules. Thanks for listening and have a great week. You came for this. Yes. I have read this book! I did not understand one word. What do you call this book? Torah. Torah? Torah. The Torah. Torah. Good. Would you trade your horse for Torah? Yes. Your horse and your boots? Yes. And your clothes? Yes. And everything else you own? Yes, everything. Even your knife? I have no knife. <laughs> You have no knife. No. If I give you back Torah, 
Will you purify your soul through fire? Yes. If I let you go, may I keep Torah? No! Your way day. Rabbi with no knife, you are a brave man. And you, who speak to Indians as if to little children, your heart is big, not as big as your mouth. But you have good feelings inside. Thanks, Chief. Thanks very much. <laughs> Wonderful. Wonderful and nice dancing. Nice does not make rain. Yes or no? Can your God make rain? Yes. But he doesn't. That's right. Why? Because that's not his department. But if he wanted to, he could? Yes. What kind of a God do you have? Don't say my God. He's your God, too. Don't give him to us. We have enough troubles with our own God. But there's only one God. What does he do? <laughs> he can do anything. Then why can't he make rain? Because he doesn't make rain. He gives us strength when we're suffering. He gives us compassion when all that we feel is hatred. He gives us courage when we're searching around blindly like little mice in the darkness. But he does not make rain. Of course, sometimes just like that, he'll change his mind. <laughs> 